Now, what we have here in front of us is the NXP Processor Expert Driver Suite version 10.4. I've already installed it, and I've also gone out to MCU on Eclipse and downloaded their components that are gonna be used to, in order to blink some LEDs and also to set up free RTOS and the trace tools as well. So what I've done here, I've already installed a number of components. I'm gonna come in here and just look at free RTOS one, one of these components. And in order to enable tracing so that I can see what tasks are executing, how long it takes, and get a little bit of a feel for what's actually happening in my system, I'm gonna come over here and click on the Percipio Trace tab. And I wanna make sure that I check this. Once I click that, it's gonna go through and generate a number of things for me, but one of the things it's gonna do is create this PTRC1 component. I'll find it over here in my processor expert view right here. If I go ahead and click on that again, it's gonna change that and let me see what settings I have for the PTRC. Now, once again, this is Percipio's Tracealyzer. And the mode that I'm gonna be running this in today is in the streaming mode. So what that means is it's gonna be constantly streaming event data over to the Tracealyzer tool. Now, I could also set this up to be in snapshot mode. In this case, I could use the built-in plugin, which I'll show you later, and I could capture little pieces of data and then view it to see what actually happened. But in this case, I wanna set up streaming mode, so I wanna make sure that under the streaming tab, I've checked that I want Sager RTT. I'm gonna leave most of these default settings just as they are here. And then I do wanna make sure that I set my recorder mode to streaming and that setup trace enable method, I like to use TRC start. So we're gonna go ahead and set those up there. We could go ahead and take a look here just to make sure um, that these are the settings that we wanna run with. They are. Since we are using the Sega RTT, it wouldn't hurt to come back over here to our components. Once again, click on that and make sure that it's set up the way that we want it to be set up. Now, sometimes you'll compile this and they'll say that there aren't a correct number of up and down channels or not, there's not enough. Usually these default to one and it, the code wants to see more than one. So I like to just set these at two, three, or four. In this case, I've set them to four. We would normally then go and do a save all. We'd generate the processor expert code. It would go through and generate a whole bunch of code for us, including the configuration files and all the code necessary for us to get trace data, but also for our configurations into free RTOS. Now, once that's actually done, what we would do is we'd open up Atala True Studio. I've already got a project here set up and ready to go. Basically, what I've done is I've set up three different tasks. Now, as we discussed, the K64F development kit has a RGB LED on board. So what I've done is I've created a task for every single LED that's on there. That's part of the RGB LED. So I have a task for blinking the blue LED, a task for blinking the red LED, and one for also blinking the green LED. Now, all three of these tasks follow essentially very similar code. What I'm doing is we set up first a delay that we want associated with the task. So in this case, I've got 500 here for the blue LED. This means that we're gonna run this task every 500 milliseconds once it completes. Uh, this is my initialization code here. I've got a blue delay here, which is just a, a counting variable that we're gonna be using. And then I have a set count that I want this to execute for. I'll talk a little bit more about that here very shortly. Then as we were talking about, this is gonna be my infinite loop for my task. I never want this task, once I create one, I never want it to just exit this function. That ends up resulting in undefined behavior. So I wanna create an infinite loop for my code to actually execute within. Now the tasks are all gonna do essentially the same thing. They're just gonna run them at different time intervals. In this case, I'm gonna turn the, the blue LED on. I'm going to delay for some period of time. And this delay is essentially a, a for loop that's just wasting time so that my task will actually take longer than a few microseconds to execute. By throwing in a delay, I'm actually gonna give milliseconds of task execution time, which will help load up the CPU and it'll make it a little bit more interesting for us to look at some of the data from the RTOS. We normally wouldn't wanna do this if we were developing a real application, but since we're just trying to explore an RTOS and how it behaves in task interactions, this'll do just fine for us today. Then I'm gonna actually delay the task. I'm basically at this point when I call VTask delay, I'm saying, hey, I've executed the code I need to, please, you know, any other task that's available, you can go and use the CPU while I don't need it. I'm gonna delay then for this 500 milliseconds, which I have set up right there. Then we're gonna come back into this task when it is the highest priority task to be executed. It's gonna turn the LED off. Once again, it's gonna burn a bunch of time, pretending like it had useful work that it had to do before then calling the delay function again and allowing other tasks to get the CPU if need be.
And then at that point, the loop repeats over and over. Each one of these tasks is gonna follow the exact same behavior. Now, one of the things that we haven't really talked about yet is this idea of reentrancy. Now, as you can see here, every single one of these tasks is gonna call this delay, non delay nonsense function. Now, in order to do that, we could have any one of these tasks interrupting any of the other ones, and we don't want our data to become corrupted. In order for each of these tasks to use the exact same function, we need to make sure that these tasks are reentrant. There are a number of characteristics that we want to make sure that a reentrant function follows. The first of which is that we want to store the caller's return address on the stack instead of in a register. So, for example, when someone calls delay nonsense, we want to make sure that delay nonsense, that the return address for the function that called it, which could be LED green or it could be LED blue or some other task, we want to make sure that that information is stored on the stack for that particular task. In this case, it is going to be. So that's the first characteristic we want to make sure that it follows. The second is that we don't want to use any global or static variables that are altered during the function call. Once again, if they are and we get interrupted for another task, we could end up corrupting the data and have some really crazy things happen to our function. So the idea behind this reentrancy is that we want to make sure that when we call delay nonsense, whether we interrupt other tasks and have multiple tasks calling it simultaneously, that it's okay and the information is basically contained still within this individual task. So in order to do that, basically what delay nonsense is doing is it's taking a pointer to a delay counter and to the target count. That information is actually resides within the individual tasks. It's located right here as red delay and then target count. This information is stored on the stack for this particular task, which means if it's interrupted while it's executing by another task and it calls that fun the next delayed no no nonsense function, then it's gonna be okay. It will then pass its own information into it, which will be stored on its own stack, keeping the tasks essentially as separate programs and they shouldn't uh, run into each other at that point. So that's the idea of reentrancy here and how we get away with one function shared amongst three different tasks. The other thing that, we, that I want to show you here before we actually look at this code executing is that we do go through and we create the tasks just like we saw a couple slides ago. So as you can see here, I've got my X task create function that I'm calling. I'm creating LED green blink here, which as you can see here defined a little bit of a snippet here for us to see what's in that particular function. This is going to be my task pointer saying this is the, t this is the function I want to call when this task comes due. I give it a name, LED green as a string. I'm also gonna give it a stack depth, just of whatever the minimum stack size is for free RTOS. Typically it's around hex 400. Um, so that's probably what it's currently set to. If I wanted to, I could go in and adjust that since all I'm doing is blinking LEDs. I probably don't need 400 hex, byte, uh, 400 hex uh, depth of location for my stack in this case, but I would perform a worst case stack analysis to make that determination. I'm not gonna pass any parameters into the task, so we're leaving that zero. And each of these tasks is gonna be set at a different priority. LED green has the highest priority set at three. Then we're gonna have LED red at two and then uh, LED blue at the lowest priority one. Now remember the idle task for free RTOS has a priority of zero, which means the blue LED is just one, one task um, priority higher than the idle task. And then the same thing as we look at LED red and green going up. So we have these relatively low priorities. Remember by default, we have a choice of zero through 31 as our priorities. Now, in order to actually execute our code, a little bit earlier I mentioned we wanna install the Percipio Tracerizer tool. What I would do now is I'd come up to the plugin here. If I wanted to, I could actually already start a debug session and then from the debug session, click Save Snapshot Trace. If I configured my project to take snapshots, uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I want to run it in, in the streaming fashion for this particular demo. So what I'm going to do is launch the Tracealyzer. A couple things I want to make sure that I do. I want to go to File, Settings. And I want to make sure that one, my JLink settings are set correctly. And I want to make sure that my streaming trace settings are also correct. In this case, I'm going to be using Sager RTT. I do have options for TCP and serial port. Um, but I want to make sure that my target RTT up and down buffers are set the same as I set them in my processor expert project. And in that case, I set the RTT component to have up and down buffers of two. So once I've gone through and done that, I'm happy with that, I can click okay. And then I'm gonna go file and I'm gonna say connect to target. Now this is gonna bring up the acquisition window here. It's not gonna be able to acquire any data until I actually run my project in Italic True Studio. 
So before I go and execute that, I'm gonna to wanna to come up here. I can click on my debug session because I've already set up the debugger. Uh, you may wanna also look at the debug options and the configuration. Just by clicking on that button, we can go in here, check our debugger. Uh, one of the things you wanna make sure is that you're set to serial wire debugger with the K64 board. Um, J-Link's fine, you might have be using the onboard debugger. That would be okay too. That would just be the PE micro debugger. And then once that's all set, I can go ahead and click debug. All right, now, now that we're into our session here, you can see we have a thread that's executing. I'm in my main function. I'm getting ready to execute my main code. Now, I'm not gonna get data or the actual application running until I actually send the command from the Tracealyzer tool saying, yes, it's time to start acquiring trace data. So I'm gonna start executing my code first. I'm gonna pull up my acquisition window here and then I'm gonna click start recording. If I have configured everything appropriately, I'll start to see this real-time data coming across the bus. As you can see here, here's the number of events so far that I've been tracing. Here's how many events per second. And you can see raw data-wise uh, how much data is actually being accumulated throughout our system here. Once I've collected enough data, I can go ahead and click Stop Recording. I then have the option, I can save the trace. One, I'm gonna to wanna to save the trace, but just by clicking View Trace, it's also gonna give me the option to save the trace data. I'll click Save. Once the trace has been saved, it'll load itself into the Tracealyzer tool. I bring that up, just as you can see here in front of us, and we can start to examine the way that our tasks actually execute it. Now, you've been able to see on the webcam that the LED started blinking. They're all running at a different rate, and it's hard to really tell what the system's actually doing and whether it's doing what we expected it to do when we designed it. So Tracealyzer is one of those tools that we can use to actually go in and see what is actually happening in our system. Now, one of the things that we can start with as I look at this tool here, I can go ahead and click on my startup code. And in the right-hand corner here, I can see how long it took my system to start up. In this case, it's saying that it took about 300 milliseconds for the system to start. What we had, could do if we had to have it under a millisecond or some very short period of time, we could then go through and optimize our code in order to try to minimize that size. Most likely the delay here is simply that I started executing my code first and between the amount of time it takes to send the messages down for it to start, that's why it took so long for the code to actually execute. Now there's also a couple basic things that we're gonna to wanna to take a look at here as we uh, dive into this trace data. One, you may notice here that there's these phantom lines here running through our trace, partway through our startup function. Now what ended up happening is that if we zoom in here, what you'll find is that this is where these tasks were actually created at. So if I go over here to the right-hand side and say, show me the kernel objects that were used, we can see here that at certain periods of time, I had my X task create LED green right here. I had a couple calls to Malik. I did another X task create call here uh, to create my, uh, my red LED function task. And then of course down here, the blue. So basically what these little line, these phantom lines are showing us is that at these periods of time, these tasks weren't just created, but they are now ready to execute on the CPU. It's just the kernel hasn't been started yet. So what we'll find is that there's gonna be some period of time here while the rest of FreeRTOS starts up and as our system gets running before we actually have any code that's ready to execute. Eventually we will get to a point, the kernel is ready to go and the system will start executing a task. So you can see here on these lifelines that this is where the LED red starts to execute we can see that the entire time that it took from startup for it to actually start executing here, it took 328 milliseconds, and the actual execution time was 145 milliseconds for it to do what it was supposed to. Now, obviously an LED is not gonna take that long to blink. Remember, we have that delay nonsense function being called, so that takes longer for our code to execute, so that we can look at something a little bit more interesting than an LED being turned on and off in a few microseconds. One of the things that we can do, we can zoom out here and we can start seeing the way in which the system behaves. So you can see here, we can even start to see a little bit of preemption occurring where one task starts to execute, another one becomes ready to execute, it overrides the other one, and then when it runs to completion, we then have the next task that begins to execute. We could accumulate as much data as we wanted and then start to scroll through these timelines and start to get a feel for how our system is actually executing. We can start looking for abnormalities in the way that our tasks are running, looking for ways that they're delayed and eventually start to look for issues that we'll start to talk about here uh, in a couple of minutes.